Hi, my name is Bob Grinier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So, a couple of months back, uh, I was at ICCF 22. Just prior to that, I'd been told about the OH groups that had been observed in Slobodan Stankovic's work. And following ICCF 22, I looked at the work of Monde Ini again, who claimed that he also saw OH uh, potentially being produced in his electrolysis. Uh, experiments and a excellent researcher called Can, uh, who um, is very very good at doing things with a very little money, and is a, a really good data analyst as well. Um, he took up the mantle, and uh, then uh, I proposed maybe looking at the Bajatov work, and he looked at that and did some inversion of the uh, anode and cathode uh, in the sort of Parkhamov Bajatov. Uh, approach and uh, he discovered this wonderful uh, thing here which you must go and have a look uh, but it's this expanding blue ring anyway about this time um, uh, I was looking at uh, what might be going on and what might be producing energetic processes and I suggested here a couple of weeks back um, that I thought that um, uh, oxygen uh, 16, two oxygen 16s, which is in the water and also in the air, uh, by far the most abundant form of oxygen, uh, could be doing an NG uh, nucleon exchange reaction, energetic nuclear nucleon exchange reaction, uh, producing 4 helium and 28 silicon, a 9.5944 MeV. And I, my proposal for that uh, my hunch was, before I looked at the tables, was that uh, silicon and oxygen are the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. And basically, if we look at this, uh, we have oxygen here, uh, by far the most abundant uh, in the Earth's crust. And then silicon is next, but oxygen-16 is by far the most abundant element isotope, uh, basically constituting most of that 46.1% uh, of the Earth's crust. Uh, and then silicon-28 is by far the most uh, um, uh, common isotope of um, uh, silicon. So you can see if you go to fuzzfizz.org, um, and I've just closed the oxygen there, <laughs> so I'm going to... Uh, carbon here, uh, which we'll come to, is almost all carbon-12. Uh, but if I type in O here, uh, and this will give us the ability to see... This is how you use this on fuzzfizz.org, and we order by uh, descending percent. You'll see that oxygen-16 is 99.759% of all of the oxygen of the most abundant element in the Earth's crust, and silicon here, 92.21%. Uh, so you can see that whilst oxygen is most of the crust, these are vanishingly small percentages down here, and so they don't exceed the amount of uh, silicon-28 uh, um, in, in the crust. And so I was suggesting that basically the reason this is, is th this is actually quad alpha, and that these are products you can actually fuse uh, to oxygen-16s with a neutrino process, and, and yield silicon, or two oxygens, and you get four uh, helium and silicon-28. So uh, most common isotope goes to most co common isotope with, um, at, in some cases, a balance of uh, uh, four helium, which is highly energetically favorable as well. Um, also, if you look down here, we've got calcium. And uh, so this is not too many jumps away. And if we're saying that the nuclear synthesis process in the crust is 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 represented by the abundance, i.e. the statistical variations of whatever could happen, end up with the result uh, that is the Earth's crust, then calcium is not too far removed from these. And uh, we already know that aluminium um, can be produced uh, uh, from the George Oshawa reaction products, and that two aluminium uh, uh, 27 goes to iron 54. And so th there's uh, combinations of these where you get to these quite quickly. Now, the, the interesting thing about calcium, it's, it's, if we look at calcium, it's uh, almost exclusively 96.97% is calcium-40, and this is what I call decalpha. So you've got, uh, um, here we have uh, uh, oct-alpha in the form of uh, uh, oxygen. If we put in uh, carbon uh, and filter that, we've got carbon. Now, Essentially, what you're thinking about is if two oxygens go to um, uh, 
one helium, uh, four helium, which is basically an alpha nuclei, and uh, one silicon, maybe the other balance of the, the alpha nuclei can build uh, other versions of clusters of alpha nuclei. So essentially, what I'm saying is, the, you know, it's predictable. Uh, and it's based, based out of a building block of this very, very stable and energetically favorable uh, alpha block. And you'll see these patterns in, in uh, Leclerc's data and so forth. So that's the basis that I made that comment. And uh, so here's the calculation. So you've got uh, oxygen 16, oxygen 16. So you put that into the calculator uh, as oxygen, oxygen, and order by MeV. Uh, and uh, that's the, the reaction that you had down there. Uh, if I can find it again, uh, somewhere here. Anyway, that, that's the reaction. And um, I, I sent these off to, to Parkamov, uh, uh, the, the video that uh, Canon had produced here, which is uh, very interesting. And he sent me back a, a paper, which I then translated. And I was absolutely stunned. So he's basically worked with Parkamov and uh, Parkamov and uh, Bajatov worked at the Kirchhoff Institute in Moscow. And they did a whole range of tests. And in this PDF, you can actually link to the videos of most of the, um, uh, the actual tests. He's actually trying to find the remaining videos that are missing. Uh, but so so if you go here and you can you can go and click on these and it's got the video. So I'm actually asking for these ones that produce the the excess. This one here that produced the excess. Um, but they're only when the the position of the the cathode is in the anode. And this means that essentially you've got all of the electrons trying to pinch down into one point. And in the, in the gap you've got uh, oxygen and nitrogen from the air and hydrogen and oxygen and whatever the the um, uh, alkaline metal or whatever it is, uh, or so, sorry, uh, sodium carbonate in this case, uh, is uh, producing the um, uh, electrolyte. Uh, but essentially you're trying to get this uh, electron density on this focused point. Uh, and so uh, th that for me was uh, interesting. Uh, and and But the, the very interesting thing was the elemental data that showed <laughs> My prediction was already been proven by Alexander Parkamov uh, in 2013 when he did this work, uh, uh, before he came up with his theory of uh, neutrino processes, uh, or at least uh, in its current form. Um, and, and here it is. You have this massive production of silicon, but you also have a massive production of calcium. Wow. Now, Someone then was looking at the, my, my discussion on this, and uh, uh, a guy called Andrew Johnson in the UK, and he sent me this video of uh, Peter Mungo and you, you, in, in Electric Universe 2017 conference. And, and, he, uh, and uh, he's saying that there are these um, things that, that instantaneously um, uh, <laughs> A petrified and I actually have a petrified wood somewhere that I got from Africa and it's always fascinated fascinated me I got it when I was about 17 or 18 uh, uh, and it totally fascinates me and I think I bought it on Victoria Falls like tourist room there so it, it come from Zimbabwe but anyway um, you can see here that this soft shelled crab uh, or the shelled crab had basically been frozen in time and its its matter had been turned to rock basically and it's in this ball and so it's almost like a plasma ball has captured this and it's changed all the atoms inside and if you think about it uh, a lot of biological life is is actually almost entirely water and what is water is is hydrogen and oxygen and what i'm saying is over here that if you take oxygen 16 and oxygen 16 here, uh, you can yield helium-4, which is another alpha particle that can go on to build more of the same, and then uh, silicon-28 with this huge energy yield. And so uh, the, the speculation here uh, here is, is that uh, potentially this is a plasmoid, um, uh, or <laughs> I would not disagree, to be honest. Um, and so... Uh, this is very fascinating. So I, I give the links the, where you can make silicon from carbon and oxygen and you can make uh, um, uh, from two to two reactions and from fusion. And you can also make calcium from uh, fusion uh, and two to two reactions. Now, um, 
This is even more interesting for me, uh, and I put, put this, it just occurred to me that during ICCF-22, I speculated that, that some of the excess heat coming from Alexander Parkamov's reactor was down to the fact that he had some boron in there. Uh, now, I didn't know he had boron in there, but I was kind of told that the previous reactor had boron in it. What I was told, just like a day or two days before I gave this presentation, was that the reason I was seeing silicon and carbon in the core material that I'd been given at Sochi when I analysed it in Alan Goldwater's Magic Sound Lab on his SEM, uh, that wasn't necessarily being synthesised because he, had he hadn't disclosed up to that point that the central core of the reactor, the very central core, was actually made of silicon carbide. Now, this is absolutely stunning to me, and I'll tell you why. Because if you take carbon and you take silicon, that fuses to calcium. Now, if you go to his data, and also if you do like a calcium oxygen silicon, calcium oxygen silicon on a 2 to 2 reaction, you have all of these reactions that yield calcium. And in the case of oxygen, uh, carbon, and all of these uh, silicon reactions, and you get these uh, helium out, hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium, but the tritium is unlikely to be produced uh, because it's radioactive, and, and the most energetic ones are up here. So these are the most likely ones to be produced, and they're all the common isotopes of calcium. So, you know, with, with these particular ones uh, uh, here uh, producing... Uh, where you have uh, the most common element of carbon and the most isotope of carbon, the most common isotope of silicon, you have it, the production of by far the most common isotope of calcium with 13.35 so mega electron volts. Calcium is 96.97% calcium 40. So here you have a scenario where uh, if we actually look, so, so I, I was sent these... Um, reaction calculations to Parkamov uh, last night and this morning he sent me through uh, a paper that he presented um, uh, on the 26th of December 2019 saying a new approach to the creation of Lenin reactors. Now the links to this paper will be in the description of this video. So this was the, re the 225 day reactor that I presented for him uh, at ICCF 22 and this is the image and apparently this the very central core here is silicon carbide and so uh, when he's analysing this, uh, he's saying that before the experiment, the material only had 1% of calcium. And at the end, it had 23% of calcium. Okay? And what I'm suggesting, that may be the case, I, I suggested in this that it might have been boron. I didn't know there was boron because we couldn't test it. But people like Cool Essence and other labs in Russia, they had confirmed that there was boron in there. And it's quite common because silicon carbide is doped often with boron. Uh, but the reality is we know there's silicon and carbon in there. And what does that yield? It mostly would yield calcium-40. Oh, my God. Wow absolutely stunning correlation between a wide range of data sets. So it looks like silicon and carbon can be a fuel if you get the environment right. What is the environment? Well, I think the nickel in the reactor is creating a material, uh, an active agent that's able to interact over large distances and Parkamov is saying that it must necessarily include neutrinos uh, to do that. And transmute bulk levels of material um, with the density of electrons in there uh, uh, and the temperature creating a, a, an environment suitable for producing cold neutrinos. And so uh, he says that it's necessary to heat to a temperature of more than 1000 degrees and this uh, um, gets the matter in uh, the communication between the particles of matter and, and electrons uh, into at least tenths of an EV. And he goes on and explains that. And this is all in his theory paper, which is here. And if you go over here, there's a link to the English translation that I did earlier in the year. And here we go. As you go up through, the, like, you've got 2,000 Kelvin, 4,000 Kelvin, 5,000. So when you get to about the uh, melting point of, um, you know, carbon and, and uh, um, uh, uh tungsten, you're getting to the point where 50% of the um, particles in the mat solid dense matter, the condensed matter, are able to synthesize cold neutrinos. And this is absolutely wonderful. 
Um, so these are the reactions and the online reaction calculator that I've done some calculations with are there. And uh, this is the previous design of the reactor and this is his proposed new design of the reactor. And here it is and he explains it and the fact that he put this together even running at 1450 degrees C with iron uh, he was able to achieve a COP of 1.32 and there it is in an air flow calorimeter. And he also talks a little bit about uh, Tadihako uh, Mizuno. But here he goes, uh, talking about the neutrino processes. So I just want to step back to one last thing. And that is, um, okay, here I've got nitrogen and oxygen. Now, obviously, I'm saying that this, this spark uh, that, that, that Can is doing when he's uh, replicating the work of uh, um, Bazatov and, and uh, uh, Parkamov, at the Kirchhoff Institute, this spark uh, that he's uh, using the discharge, I'm saying is actually in air. And so you have nitrogen in play as well. And if you add nitrogen and oxygen just into the mix, the very first nitrogen 14, the most common isotope of nitrogen, and oxygen 18. So we'll go, we'll go down to something that's got a common oxygen uh, isotope. So oxygen, um, oxygen 16 down here with nitrogen 14. It produces a proteum, so that it produces atomic hydrogen and silicon-29. So we have a whole plethora of exchange reactions here that can synthesize um, uh, hydrogen, deuterium, uh, and uh, uh, helium, and uh, uh, does actually produce uh, silicon isotopes. So uh, there you have it. Now, why I found this particularly interesting is because of Dr. Eagley's research. And he gave me this paper, uh, this rather thick tome here. It's one of a couple. They are available online. Um, but this is his uh, Hungarian ball lightning observations. And without delving completely into it, it was done over a couple of decades, completed it until 1990. And in it, he talks about one time where you had a plasmoid, uh, a ball lightning, uh, one, one, one anecdotal reference, uh, one, one uh, person who gave testimony. And he said that the, the uh, ball lightning was pouring out sand. Well, how was it doing that? Well, could it have been feeding off the nitrogen and oxygen in the air and producing silicon? And obviously there's more oxygen to go around. I mean, could it just have been, you know, uh, oh, we got reactions here between nitrogen and nitrogen. Surely we, we have to, to magnesium, but then magnesium can breed on uh, to making calcium. I mean, the sand could be various materials, but <laughs> just just thinking about this, you know, if, you, if you've got reactions that are producing hydrogen, another, another example he gave is where water came out. Well, if, if you've got only nitrogen and oxygen coming in, but you have high, like nitrogen, nitrogen, okay, so the, there are ones where you have nitrogen and oxygen and you have hydrogen and silicon coming out. Well, then you've got more oxygen going in. You can actually synthesize water in one of these uh, ball lightnings. So the observations, as recorded here, seen by real people in, in the flesh are actually explainable by something that is able to eat the air around it and convert it into other elements. And could this be the explanation for what you're seeing here? In that all of the oxygen and material in here was transmuted into preferentially and energetically favorably uh, uh, silicon and stuff and following the abundance of uh, oxygen to silicon to aluminium to iron to calcium. I think, I think probably we are on the verge of a complete change in the understanding of how things got petrified, got uh, uh, exist uh, in the quantities they do in the crust, and uh, it's an electron-driven, condensed, in-condensed matter process, which the electrons being very high and dense will raise the temperature to a point where uh, neutral things are born in the form of neutrinos over 0.1 EV, but not very, very energetic, the below, much below uh, 1 EV. And that these uh, have a de Broglie wavelength that's in the microns and can spread across many, many atoms and cause them to take on electrons and as nuclei to fuse together and uh, uh, do full on transmutation. And this would explain a very large body of observations, both in nature and in experiments over the last 25 years. So with that, I want to wish you all a happy new year. And uh, I think... 
2020 may be the year of Lena.